disciples get back into the boat and cross to the other side of the lake while he sent the people home. After sending them home, he went up into the hills by himself to pray. Night fell when he was there alone. Meanwhile, the disciples were in trouble far away from the land. For a, strong and, for a strong wind had risen, and they were fighting heavy waves. About three o'clock in the morning, Jesus came toward them, walking on the water. When the disciples saw him walking on the water, they were terrified. In their fear, they cried out, it's a ghost. He said, take courage. He said, don't be afraid. He said, take courage, I am here. Then Peter called to him, Lord, if it's really you, tell me to come walking on the water. Heavenly Father, we come before you and we thank you so much, Lord God. Lord God, that Lord, that in the midst of the storms, there you are. The Lord God, you have never left us. You've never given up on us. But you are there with us every step of the way. And so, Father, Lord God, as we come here this morning, we ask, Lord, that you would have your way in our lives, Lord God. We just want to seek what you have for us this morning. Because, Lord God, your word is so full of riches, Lord God. May we glean from them today, Lord God. Apply them to our lives and live that miraculous life you want us to live. And so, Father, we ask right now, Lord God, that you would have your way in our hearts and our minds. And for everything that is said and done, may you and you alone receive all praise, glory, and honor. It's in the name of Jesus we pray. And everybody said, amen. amen. Look to someone before you're seated and say, get out of the boat. Not the church, the boat. Come back in. No, just kidding. No one's leaving. There is so much to unpack in this. Uh, you know, even you're going to hear an awful lot of things. And even then, there's still more to unpack. And God is good. And his truths live on forever. One of the things that we know about storms, including the storms that we face in our life situations, is that storms can rise up quickly and without warning. I remember one uh, year, I was uh, probably about 12 years old, 10 to 12 years old. We went to our grandparents in that vicinity, and instead of staying with them, we decided to sleep out in a tent. It was just me, my dad, and my sisters, and we were in a tent in the woods. I remember getting the permit. We didn't even know where we were going to go at first. My dad was just driving along looking for a place to camp out. And we did. We camped out. In the morning, it was, I remember during the night, it was heavy rains and everything else. And uh, we just hunkered down in that tent. And uh, it was kind of neat to hear the rain hitting against the tent and things like that. We enjoyed that. In the morning, we woke up to my grandparents coming in. You know, they had dr driven up and they were searching for us. They said, are you all right? Are you all right? Are you all right? What had happened was during the night, no one could get a hold of us. All the lines were down and everything else. The, there was a tornado that went through. And the tornado made a beeline right through us. When we got out of the tent, the trees were down. You know, there were so many things that were there. It appeared that where we were, the tornadoes, they hop. And it hopped right over top of us and kept on going. When we were going home, we saw telephone poles down. We were being rerouted because those poles that were being down, there was electrical lines in there and in the water, and we were being rerouted. I remember we went to a diner to stay there or to eat, have breakfast, and we were just amazed. We just left everything there. And, and I remember seeing trees going through homes and things like that. It was just amazing. And yet we went back to our campsite later that day just to see our tent still up. Just amazing. It was God's grace, God's mercy. But the point is, is that we never knew that there was going to be a storm. I guarantee you, if we knew that there was going to be a tornado that night, there's no way we're camping out that night. We had no idea. But such is the nature of storms. And I'm not just talking about the natural storms that come around, but also the storms that we face in our lives. They can rise up at any time. We think we're doing good, and then all of a sudden something comes up, 
and it's a huge storm. Storms can come when we least expect them, when our lives seem to be just going great. The disciples had just witnessed an incredible miracle. It says in Matthew 14, 22, immediately after this. Well, what was it that came after this? Or what came before this event of Jesus walking on water? It was Jesus feeding the 5,000. They had just witnessed something that was glorious. Something that was miraculous. So much so that the people that were there that witnessed that miracle wanted to go and make Jesus, you know, king. Which is why he had to get out of there. It wasn't his time to become king here. He still had to be First and foremost, the Messiah. He had to be that sacrifice for you and me. So he gets the disciples in a boat. But think about this. You just see an incredible miracle, so much so that the people know that who they're looking at right now is the prophet that Moses talked about. And so they were on a high. Why would they expect riding that kind of a high, seeing that kind of a, a miracle being done, that now there was a storm just brewing, just coming in. No one saw it coming. It's unexpected. Storms can come while you are in the middle of God's will as well. Think about this. Again, going back to verse, 40, uh, v- verse uh, 22. It says that, it, you know, if you think about it, it, was, it says immediately after this, Jesus insisted his disciples get back into the boat, you know, and go to the other side. In Mark's account, you know, it even says that it was immediately insisted. Jesus immediately and insisted that his disciples get in the boat and leave him. Probably the insistence that they probably didn't want to leave Jesus there. But Jesus wanted to stay. And he insisted, get in the boat. So they were smack dab in the will of God. Following God when the storm came up. And maybe, you know, it's not always so much, we, we look at, the, where's the sin in your life that these things are happening to you? And it may have absolutely nothing to do with sin in your life. Storms come and go. Storms can take advantage. It doesn't really matter. It's interesting. If the disciples had just stayed on on land through the night, the disciples wouldn't have had to face that storm. And yet Jesus says, go. Get in that boat and go to the other side. Some storms are so severe, let me tell you, all your might, all your strength, all your wisdom, all your money, And all your life experiences can save you from some of these mighty storms. Think about it. It just can't. These disciples were some of the most experienced fishermen. And they didn't make a dent on their trip. In fact, they were going further and further away as the night went on. All their experiences couldn't stop, prevent this storm, and get them to where they needed to go. And so if you think for a moment there isn't a single person that these storms can wreak havoc with, that you're immune to these storms, think again. And you will lack the resources to get to that other side where God wants you to be. The difference is that in all of these things, whatever these storms represent, what will get you through it will be Jesus. I want to take a look at five lessons that we can apply to our lives when facing these storms. And the first thing is that you need to be praying before the storms come. Before you go any further, take another step. You should be praying. In Matthew 14, 23, it says this. After sending them home, he went up into the hills by himself to pray. This is Jesus. Night fell where he was there alone. And meanwhile, the disciples were in trouble far away from the land. And see, Jesus had just fed thousands of people. And I'm sure he was exhausted. I'm sure, you know... His human side was sitting sitting there saying, you know, listen, I'm exhausted. I need some time to refresh. You know what? Let's just let the disciples row, and I can just lay down in the boat and just relax and get to the other side. Because, see, once the disciples left them, how was Jesus getting to that other side? He was going to have to walk. So not only is he exhausted here, going to meet the disciples, him walking, they already took the boat and going over, 
That was the plan. He decided to do something different. He decided to pray. He wanted to spend time with his father. You see, Jesus didn't see praying as a chore. How many people have I come across that say that praying is just a chore? I don't have time to pray. Let me, let, let me ask you, do you have time to talk to your children? Do you have time to talk to your spouse? Do you have time to talk to your boss at work or your employees if you are the boss? I mean, do you have time to communicate with anyone? Then how in the world can we not communicate with the person that is the most important person in our lives? And if we have a personal relationship with Jesus, how in the world can we sit there and say, I'll get to you later? Man, we need to be prayed up. We need to be in prayer at all times because it's about a relationship. It's not a chore. It's not something that you just do. This is why Jesus was so against prayers that are just repetitious because that becomes a chore. It may be okay the first couple times you say these prayers, but if you're saying the same thing the same way over and over and over and over again, what's the difference between you and an automaton? What, what's the difference? There is no difference. At that point, with AI and robots, you know, I'll just tell them, hey, listen, just pray for me. If all it was is a matter of saying these exact words in a particular way, as many times and as often as possible, man, I'd be having everything to say those prayers. But God doesn't want to hear it from an automaton. He doesn't want you to be robotic in your relationship with him. He wants you to be praying because he is Abba, Father to you. When the storm came, Jesus was ready to face it. He had been in prayer. He was not only ready to face it, but he was also able if we prayed before the storms came, we would be better prepared to deal with them, wouldn't we? Because we're staying in tune with the Father. No wonder the Apostle Paul writes in Ephesians 6.18, and pray in the Spirit on all occasions. All occasions. Happy, glad, sad, angry. Pray on all occasions, no matter what it is, at a wedding, at a funeral, and everything in between with all kinds of prayers and requests. Notice there's no particular thing you shouldn't be praying about, but you should be praying at all times. With this in mind, be alert. And always, when you feel like it, pray. No. And always keep on praying for all the saints. I wanted to start off with this because you see a pattern from Jesus that we should emulate in our own lives. Amen? I wanted to start with this because everything that follows in this passage, everything that follows, I honestly believe the stage was set because Jesus was praying. Jesus didn't call the storm in, but Jesus was ready when the storm did come. And everything that you see that transpires you can find that it was followed because his prayers were so impactful. Keep that in mind as we go through. Be praying now. You'll be able to face those storms when they come. Secondly, don't give up. Don't stop rowing. Keep rowing. In Mark 6, 48, he saw the disciples straining at the oars because the wind was against them. About the fourth watch of the night, he went out to them walking on the lake. The disciples were rowing. If you look at all the different accounts, this is Mark's account, Matthew. They all have a, an account of this. If you bring them all together, you begin to find out some incredible things. That's why when you do your study, just don't look at one account. If that account is mentioned in other Gospels, look at it, read it, compare them. Get yourself a parallel Bible. It's great because you can look at all the versions, not all the versions, but all the passages together. You'll see how it plays out. The disciples, if you take a look at this, the disciples were actually rowing for about nine hours. They were rowing for about nine, think about that. Do you know how exhausted you'd be? Man, I get exhausted just, you know, going a little bit from rowing. Okay, got to stretch out. Nine hours. 
If you see the Sea of Galilee and you see where it goes, they probably left somewhere in the middle. And and two different passages have them going one way or the other. But always at the top, if this is how the lake is, they would have gone probably this way. I think they went, I have my own, uh, that's too much to explain. I'll get into the weeds here. But bottom line is, instead of going to where they needed to go, they went almost the same exact direction, but to the middle of the lake. It's interesting, John 619 in the Amplified says they rode three or four, they had rode three or four miles. Over nine hours, they rode three uh, three to four miles, and it wasn't in the direction they wanted to go. It was in the middle of the lake they find themselves. All their efforts couldn't get them to the shore and to their destination, which is interesting. Here's the storm throwing them and moving them. In all of that, though, they never gave up rowing. Their lives depended on it, and they knew that. So they kept rowing and rowing. And Jesus was about to show them something different. It's interesting because, according to Mark, our account that I just saw here, it says that Jesus saw the disciples straining at the oars. And the Amplified says they were troubled and tormented in their rowing. But Jesus saw this. Now, I I have to wonder. I've been on a party boat. And no, it's not a party boat with beer and liquor and things like that. I'm thinking, well, Pastor, we're on a party boat. No, the party boats, they leave in the morning. It's a huge bunch of people, you know, getting on there and we go fishing. You know, it's it's, it's a group thing and you find these, what's called a party boat. (laughs) When you don't catch anything, it's not a party, let me tell you. If you get seasickness the way I got it, that's not a party. But anyway, I digress. Man, I, I spent hours in the cabin, man. It was terrible. But you're going to lunch, so I'm not going to get too much into that. But it's interesting. Think about this. I've been... You know, in, in those situations where the ro- boats are rocking, the we- waves are going, the wind is going, and there's that night and the storms and things like that, you see all that taking place. And I just have to ask, at night, the disciples are three to four miles out, there's a storm. How did Jesus see him? Hard to see him, isn't it? Three, four miles from the coast? It goes back to prayer. I honestly believe when it says that Jesus saw them, I believe it was in his prayer. I believe probably what stopped them from praying was to go out there and say, listen. Because not only did you have to be able to, you have to know where they are. They're three to four miles out. You have to know where to look. And he goes right to them. Jesus' prayer life, being led by the Holy Spirit, he probably saw it in a vision. He had clarity. This is why we need to be praying and caught up in all of that. 1 Peter 3.12 says this, For the eyes of the Lord are on the righteous, and his ears are attentive to their prayer. You may think that God doesn't see you in the troubles and the storms that you are in, but let me tell you, this verse right here, For the eyes of the Lord are what? On the righteous. God's eyes are on you this morning. He sees the situations you may be going through. And it may seem like you're drowning in the storms of life. Let me tell you, he sees you and he cares for you. I am sure that Satan saw this as an opportunity, probably saw the disciples separated from Jesus, and probably saw that this was an opportunity, now that they're by themselves, alone, away from Jesus, I can get them. And what are you going to do then, Jesus? God loves you. He won't let you drown. He will be with you every step of the way. Isaiah 43, 2 says it this way. When you pass through the waters, I will be with you. When you are in your boat and the storms are going crazy, God says, I will be with you. You have to believe that. He'll be with you every step of the way. He says, and when you pass through the rivers, they will not sweep over you. No matter how high those waves are coming, disciples, Jesus is on his way. Jesus will meet you in that storm. 
And when you walk through the fire, you will not be burned. The flames will not set you ablaze. Jesus shows up in the storm, amen? He will show up in that storm every single time. He will be with you. He will never leave you nor forsake you. And I love that last part of that verse, when you walk through the fire. Doesn't that remind you of Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego? There they were in the fiery furnace. And who shows up in there with them? It was Jesus. The fourth man looked like the Son of God. He was there with them in the fire. He is there with the disciples in the storm. And he will be with you every step of the way. Amen? Amen. Amen. God is good. Even though the disciples had rode for as much as nine hours, and they were not able to get anywhere they wanted, yet they never gave up. We know the verse that says, nothing is impossible for God. And this is true. But when you're in the storms, and if you are tempted to give up, and you do give up, if you walk away, don't we take the God option off the table? If we just give up on things and walk away from those situations, God may want you in. See, God put the disciples into that storm. You don't think that God didn't know that the storm was coming? He knew. He knew full well. He could have said, hey, Jesus, don't send them. But he doesn't. He lets them go. Jesus didn't get a check in his spirit. Didn't say, hey, listen, you better not do this. You know, whoa, be careful. No, Jesus, first of all, he knew who he was, fully God, fully man. But he knew exactly what, if anything was going to happen, he was also limited because of his man, being fully man. He allowed himself to be limited while he walked on this earth, and yet he did not fear. Don't take the God option off the table. If you know that God is with you, you continue to stay the course. Because if you change course, you take the God option off on that. You may not get to the other side that you wanted to or maybe that you felt that you were told to. How many people have stepped away from ministry? How many people have given up on God, given up on their family, given up on their children, given up on their government, given up on their country, given up on so many different things that they've stopped praying? Because what's the sense? I've been praying for all these years and nothing changes. That's not how you act. You never give up. You continue to row, amen? You continue to pray. You continue to go. Because you know, you know that God is miraculous. That God can do anything. And you don't know the timing yet. So you continue to put your hand to the plow. You continue to put your hands to the, ro the oars. And you continue to row. You continue to plow. You do whatever it needs to be done. But you don't give up. Amen. There may be times in your lives it may seem like God isn't aware of your problems, like you're just all by yourself, like he isn't doing anything about them. That is not true. That's what the enemy wants you to believe. He wants and loves to separate you from your father. That's what he wants to do. Because he knows if I can separate you from your father, I got you. But if you read Romans 8... 38 and 39 and following. Nothing can separate you from the love of God. Neither height, nor depth, nor angels, nor demons. Nothing can separate you from the love of God. See, that's how, even though you don't go by feelings, feelings will betray you every time. It may feel like you're alone, but if you were able to see you know, the next realm, if you were able to see the heavenlies and God opened your eyes to the spiritual realm, I wonder what you would see. You would see you were never alone. Not one single time did God ever leave you alone. Isaiah 30, 18 says, yet the Lord longs to be gracious to you. He rises to show you compassion. Isn't that interesting? God rises to show you compassion. For the Lord is a God of justice. Blessed are all who wait for him. I talked a lot about being patient just a couple of weeks ago. I encourage you to listen to that because you see almost everything. The miracles, is called, you know, when you see a miracle take place, it's also about waiting. You see miracles take place, it's also about doing the same thing, continuing to, to stay the course, not just going off and doing your own thing. And remember this. The more the waves begin to, and the wind begins to take you, off course. If it's the winds, not you. 
and pull you into deeper and deeper waters. Because that's what it would be like. The further you go out into the middle of the lake, the deeper the waters they are. Then greater the miracle. Because if we know that God will show up, watch the miracle that will take place. But if you give up, you'll miss that. Do not give up. You think about this. Jesus didn't need to walk on water if the boat never left the shore. Jesus would never have, never have left and walked on water if the disciples weren't in trouble. There was no need. Why would you just walk in the middle of a storm just for the sake of walking in the middle of a storm? No, he cares about his own. They were in trouble. And so he walks on water because there was a storm. They were not safe. And he goes to them because he cares for you. How much does God care for you? Oh, man, he cares for you a whole lot. He won't leave you an orphan. Amen? He will be with you every step of the way. Three, don't let fear get the best of you. Do not let fear get the best of you. Going again to Mark's account in Mark 6.50. They all saw him and were afraid and were terrified. Immediately, he spoke to them and said, Take courage, it is I. Don't be afraid. When they saw Jesus, they thought they saw a ghost. <laughs> it was unexpected. I mean, who would have thought, right? You're rowing for nine hours. They probably thought their eyes were, you know, seeing things. And then as it got closer, they're probably saying, That is a ghost. I mean, they couldn't even make it out the closer he got. How was Jesus going to be able to make it out who they were? Unless he had spiritual sight. Goes back to the prayer. I just got to keep pointing that out. You pray now, it'll sustain you through. God will not. Just don't pray in the middle of the storm. You should be doing that too. But man, be prepared for anything that because you don't know when it may come. I harp on that a little bit. Their fear prevented them from seeing Jesus. This is one of the major problems with fear. Fear blows things out of proportion, always, always. One of the things I put in my head all the time, that the situations when things come, and let me tell you, there, we find ourselves in, under huge attacks, and one of the things I always have to tell myself, it's never as bad as it seems, and it's never as good as I may think it is. You just have to always keep yourself balanced to be prepared for anything. But fear blows things out of proportion. Fear prevents you from properly discerning the situation. Disciples didn't discern what was going on. They couldn't because they were too afraid. And fear causes us to see things that aren't real. They couldn't discern that it was Jesus. They thought it was a ghost. They weren't able to see properly because they were blinded by their fear. And it was totally blown out of proportion. And Jesus, interestingly, doesn't sit there and rebuke them. Oh, he will later on. And he'll even do it directly to Peter. But at this particular point, he doesn't rebuke them. What he does instead, he encourages them. <laughs> Maybe because if they continued in this fear, they wouldn't even let Jesus on the boat. <laughs> no, get away from us. You're not coming on here, you ghost. <laughs> You're not going to take us, you ghost. You know, he had to do something because they weren't going to let him on. Interesting. But look how Jesus encourages them. He says three different things which you can take encouragement for even now. He says, take courage. Take courage. In other words, get rid of that spirit of fear. Don't allow that because it's going to skew everything you see. It'll skew, the, you know, the spiritual realm. It'll skew how you think about God. It'll warp your doctrine. Get rid of it. Get rid of that spirit of fear. Take courage. And he says something that's quite remarkable. He says, take courage, it is I. In the Greek, it literally is ego and me. If you know what ego and me is, it is literally I am. Jesus sitting there saying, take courage, I am. That's the literal translation. I am first shows up in a fiery bush to Moses, when God says, when Moses asks for his name, who shall I say sends me? He says, tell them that I am that I am sends you. This is where we get the word Yahweh. 
from that. That's what Yahweh means. I am that I am. Think about it. Jesus is saying, he's, he's not pulling any punches here. Ego me. I am. I was in the bush with Moses. I am. He's letting them know a little bit about him. What he's telling them, <laughs> he even says before Abraham, I am. Ego me. It's remembering who he is, his character. Remember who he is in the midst of everything going through. Just remember the God you serve. He's a God yesterday, today, and forever. He sees everything. He can make anything happen, and he's got your back. Remember the character of God. I am. He said, then he says, don't be afraid. Take courage, but then don't be afraid. Understand who he is. Don't be afraid because you can't operate in faith if fear is present. You have to understand, Jesus, Yeshua, operates outside of the storm. Amen? The winds can't knock him over. The, storm, you know, the waters can't drown him. He operates outside of the storms, and he will take you with him. Amen? God is so good. Four, trust God to see you safely out of the storm. It is through the storms that our faith are always tested and proved, are they not? We don't even know how much faith we have until we're tested. In Matthew 14, 28 and 29, it says this, Lord, if it is you, Peter replies, tell me to come to you on the water. Come, he says. Then Peter got down out of the boat, walked on water, and came toward Jesus. See, faith isn't merely a belief system. It's not about doctrines. When you hear God tell you to do something, you have to act on it. You can't just stay in the boat. And for some of us, we've stayed in that boat way too long. It's okay to stay the course. But if Jesus says, get out, you have to get out. Move out. Do what God is telling you to do. You know, at the moment Jesus replies to Peter, come. Everything hinged upon faith at that moment. Well, you know, physically, you know, the, the physical laws, you know, the tension of the water and the waves and the wind, you know, that fetch, you know, there's no way I can just, you know, walk on water, Jesus. <laughs> you know something I don't? No, he didn't sit there and reason it. He didn't sit there and try to let, no. He said, can I come? He had a green light from God, Come. Faith is acting on the word of God, regardless of what it is. One word, two words, sentences, a dream, a vision. You know it's of, of God. You need to move out because you know it's God. All Peter had to go on was one word, come. And he got out of the boat. <laughs> it's interesting. We think about this. Peter was the only one to walk on water. Peter was the only one to even ask Jesus if he can come out there with him. I wonder what everyone else was thinking. You know, you would think that after they saw him get out, oh, you know what, I'm going to. Can we come? No one even asked. No one said a word. They just watched Peter. All right, your funeral. We'll pick you up and bring you in the land. <laughs> hey, you know. We have a life preserver. We'll throw it out to you. A lifeline. He doesn't take a lifeline. He doesn't take anything that tied him to that boat. Jesus had a new direction for him. Jesus had something else going on in his life. What got Peter out of the boat was his faith in Jesus. Nothing else. And that will get you out of the boat as well. Is it time to get out of the boat? You've been sailing for so long. Jesus says in John 14, 1, do not let your hearts be troubled. Regardless of any storm that may come, do not let your hearts be troubled. Trust in God, trust also in me. That's exactly what Peter did that day. He trusted God and jumped out of that boat. Hey, you got to remember, Peter didn't have to get out of the boat. It would have been easier to ride the storm. At least in most of our mindsets, we will be thinking, hey, listen, isn't it just easier to ride out the storm in the boat? 
he forgot the storm. He forgot everything else because his eyes was on Jesus. But staying in the boat, think about this. Staying in the boat, when God says to come out of the boat, staying in the boat means you're going to go wherever that boat goes. Because boats are confining. Boats have a dimension. You can measure it. You know exactly how far it goes. You go beyond the dimensions of the boat, you're in the water. And you are forced to go wherever the boat or whoever the captain of the boat is. It'd be interesting, you go on a cruise line, you sit there and you tell the captain of the ship, you know, I know we were supposed to be taking that cruise to the Caribbean, but you know what? Can we go to Alaska instead? You know, you're not going there. You paid a ticket to go to the Caribbean, and that's where you're going. <laughs> They're not going to listen to you. You're in the boat. You're going where the boat's supposed to be going. You knew before you got on. And sometimes that's good enough for us in the beginning. We know that God puts us in that boat and says, hey, listen, you go and stay that course. But sometimes we need to change boats. Sometimes we just need to get out of the water, you know, or get out of the boat. You know, stepping out of the boat allows you to be led by Jesus and not by the boat. And so often we just be confined by that. And all of a sudden all we're thinking about that and the storms and we're rowing and rowing. And Jesus say, come out. Step out. And all we got to go on is his word. If he's telling you to get out of the boat, if he's telling you to change course, then you change course. But we don't do it on our own. That's the difference. Jeremiah 33, verse 3 says this. Call to me, and I will answer you, and show you great and mighty things which you do not know. Isn't that interesting? You don't know. But you call to God, and he will answer you. He will show you the things that you don't know yet. The places that you need to go. The ministry that you need to have. And lastly, be consistent in your faith. You may be walking on water now. But if you're not careful, you may be sinking tomorrow. There are two verses that show just how easy it is to lose faith. And the first one is found in uh, Matthew 14, 29. And 30. It says this, come, he says, and Peter gets down out of the boat, walks on the water and came toward Jesus. I mean, he's in the water and he's walking on water. There's only two people, whoa, there's only two people that have ever done that in the history of walking on water without having something underneath you. Peter was one of them. Of course, it was short-lived, because in verse 30, it says, but when he saw the wind, he took his eyes off of Jesus for a moment. He was afraid and beginning to sink, cried out, Lord, save me. When he got out, he wasn't focusing on the wind. The wind didn't just like, hey, wow, where'd you go? The wind was there. They'd been going for nine hours, three to four miles in a different direction than where they wanted to go. It's not what they wanted. So he, it wasn't like it just sprung up on him. He was out there, and when the wind was coming, for a moment, he took his eyes off of Jesus on his problem, and he began to sink. You continue to focus on your problems, and your problems alone, I guarantee you, you're going to sink. If you look at your own finances and see how you're going to pay your mortgage, you're going to sink. Not saying that you shouldn't be working. That's not what I'm saying. Because if you can work and you're not working and you've been turning down jobs thinking that God's going to supply my mortgage, I got it, you're going to be on the street soon. That's testing God. That's not doing everything you're supposed to be doing. Remember, we're still under that very original curse that we will work by the sweat of our brow. Can't get around that. We've been doing everything in our power to get away from that, right? Get robots to do the work for us. You sweat. <laughs> anyway, he became afraid. Fear was gone when he got out of the boat because he was, his eyes were fixed on Jesus. There was no fear. It was when he took it off. Fear comes in and robs you of your faith because you can't 
be walking on water and be fearful. You can't be full of faith and full of fear. It is impossible. It's impossible. He was afraid when they first saw Jesus. Jesus calms it down. Don't be afraid. Come to me. And that fear was gone. And he walks with great faith on water. And what happens right after? Fear comes in because he took his eyes off of Jesus on the problem at hand. And he begins to sink. Storms can come into your lives and distract and separate you from God, because that's what they want to do. It's only you can cause that separation. Anything that sits there, Jesus is right there. You don't want to go to him, that's on you. You put your eyes on the fear and everything, you accept the fear, don't accept fear in your life. Don't think the enemy isn't out there trying to trip you up, because he is. The second verse we see is in Mark 6, 51, and I'm almost done. Then he climbed into the boat with them, and the wind died down. Interesting. As soon as Jesus gets in the boat, don't tell me this wasn't a spiritual attack taking place in a physical. This was spiritual. The enemy wanted them. He just gets in. Jesus didn't even speak to the waves, didn't do anything. So, okay, now he's with them. Let's go. <laughs> you know, we tried for nine hours. They held out long enough for Jesus to be with them and save them. That's okay, isn't it? They were completely amazed. And at first, their amazement appears to be good, but when you continue to read, it says in verse 52, for they had not understood about the loaves, the miracle that they just saw nine hours ago. They saw an incredible miracle. They were on a high. They forgot about that. How important is it to remember the miracles that God did in your life? From the moment you got saved, and maybe even before you got saved, that led you to the Lord. Never forget the goodness of God in your life. Never forget what he has done in your life. If he did it then, he's going to continue to do it every step of the way. He loves you. And we remember that. We build our faith upon what God has been doing, upon the Word of God. And we, don't, we hold on to those. Those are rare gems that we hold on to. We should go back to them in our journals and say, wow, I remember. Devil, you're a liar. I remember how God saved me then. I remember how he saved my marriage. I remember how he saved my children. I remember how he saved my job. I remember in the midst of all those storms, he was there with me. He never let me go. Devil, you're a liar. You don't allow that to come in. The root cause of their amazement was due to a hard heart. The Bible says it. It says, for they had not understood about the loaves. Their hearts were hardened. Interesting. Having a hard heart can come from a lack of understanding, which the Bible clearly says here, they didn't understand. And that also led to that hard heart because of a lack of understanding. Lack of maybe proper theology. Maybe even a lack of belief. See, when all those things take place and hard hearts there, we end up explaining away or minimizing the miracles of God in our lives. It's easy to do. We can explain it away. Well, you know what? You know, the natural laws of this and things like that. Eh, it's just a coincidence. Let me tell you right off of hand. If you're sitting there saying that was just a coincidence, or if you're listening to someone says that's just a coincidence, don't buy into that. There are no coincidences in the plan of God for your life. None. Everything is steered by him. And our belief or lack thereof, we can have a little bit of, then he has to sit there and say, oh, you weren't believing me, come back in this way. I wonder if Peter never gave in to that fear, never took his eyes off of Jesus. I wonder how much, I wonder if they would just circle the boat. Come on, Peter, let's go. You know, anyone else want to join in? No. His faith got him only so far. I wonder if he would have been able to walk back to shore or walk the rest of the way. We don't know. We'll never know because it was the fear that stopped. Jesus didn't stop him from walking on water. That's what I want you to see. It wasn't Jesus that stopped him and prevented him to get back into the boat. No. Peter stopped himself from walking on water, and that's how much faith happens in our lives. We prevent God from doing work in our lives because at some point in our lives, the journey gets a little too hard, and we begin to give up. Well, you know, God got me this far, but maybe I need to do the rest of it my own. You know, God only helps those who help themselves, you know. <laughs> Listen, 
We started off by saying there's going to be some storms that you can't buy your way out. You don't have the experience to get your way through it. You don't have enough strength, the, you know, whatever else. You don't have it. If it depends on God, you do not give up on him. You stay the course until you hear otherwise. He says, come, you get out of the boat. A hard heart will prevent you from believing. It will prevent you from stepping out, of, out in faith. And when you do step out in faith, it'll be fear that will sink you. It is that simple. It may not be an easy task because we're so tethered to this world and to the things of it. We think we need things that we really don't. And so we cry out to God for desires that we shouldn't even have or even be praying for. We cry out for wants that he sits there and says, man, you're crazy. I want that Maserati. I know a couple people I would like to leave in the dust. <laughs> yeah, let's go up to that line. <laughs> yeah, all right, let's go. Jesus didn't ride a stallion. He rode a donkey. Think about it. The best ride then of that day would have been a war horse. Maybe a stallion. Going through the desert, give me that camel. Jesus, donkey. I need that palace, Lord. I want the riches. I want what that person has. I, you know, I need to live large. And yet Jesus came and didn't live in a palace. He was born in a manger. Laid in a manger, born in a barn, right? He had no riches. And we go after some things that are really crazy. And I think it scratches God in. And, uh, and, and, and where, does, where does my mission fit into all of that? Are you still going and making disciples? Are you still doing the things, praying over the sick? Are you still praying for people? Are you busy about the kingdom of God or just... Patting your wallet. But Lord, if you would just bless me with that Maserati, I can do an awful lot of good for it. But you can't carry, you can't, you can't tow our trailer for the Royal Rangers. How many people can you get in a Maserati? One. To come to church. Well, I'll just pick them up one by one. <laughs> the rest of your family had to stay there and I keep going back and forth. The point is, we get our situation, we get mixed up sometimes. But in the end, when we're following God and his directives and we're praying in his will, all the other things are added to us. Can't say you're going to get a Maserati. I don't even really care for one. I just use that. But he knows what you need before you ever ask him. And when the storms come, all of our possessions can't save us anyway. The only thing that can save us is Jesus himself. God blesses us so we may be a blessing to others, no doubt. And I'm not saying that he won't bless you with good things, even expensive things. But he, what he is saying is that everything he gives you is a gift from him and should be used for his kingdom, no matter what it is. And a hard heart that's tied and tethered to this world forgets that. <clears throat> Jesus says, come. Then Peter got down out of the boat, walked on the water and came toward him. And so my question to you is, are you ready to get out of the boat? Do you have that kind of faith that says, hey, listen, I know God is calling me. I am ready to step out of that boat. To go to the next chapter, what God has in my life. God loves you, and he is directing you in an incredible way. We all know and sense things are different in America than pre-COVID. Things have changed dramatically. 
and if it's just the end of America or if it leads to Jesus' soon return, regardless of where it may take us, we're going to have to be people that are willing to get out of the boat when Jesus has come. We're going to have, if we're going to make a difference, we need to be open to what God has in our lives. Be obedient. If he says to get in the boat, you get in the boat. He says get out of the boat, you get out of the boat. I'd rather live my life being led by Jesus than being led by a boat. Step out of that. Come out of it, whatever it may be, and watch how big your God is. He will be with you every step of the way. He'll show up in those storms. Trust him. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, we come before you this morning and we are so grateful. We are so grateful, Lord God, that you're doing an incredible thing in our lives. I know, Lord God, that there are so many that seek you and love you and know you. And Father, we pray right now, Lord, that you would minister to each and every person here. That, Lord God, that we would serve you in all ways. And Father, you see the storms we may be facing now. You know the storms that we may be facing tomorrow. Father, we pray, Lord, that you'll continue to keep us strong, to always encourage us to live our lives for you. And Father, Lord God, that when you say come, we will come. We will go to you and to no other. We don't want to ever take our eyes off of you, Lord God, and put it on this world or on the fears or anything else that, that feed into those fears. We keep it on you. Our path is pure. Our path is true. Because, Lord God, you keep us on it. It's where we hear, Lord God, whether we walk to the right or to the left, we'll hear a voice behind us saying, this is the way, walk ye in it. Father, thank you so much for your Holy Spirit that lives within us, that guides us every step of the way. We can't walk on water if we never get out of that boat. So, Father, we pray right now, Lord, that you would help us, show us. If there are things within us, Lord God, that are confining us, if we are being led by others, maybe even by ourselves, and not you, show us, reveal it to us. Because, Lord God, we don't want to be just following the boat. We just don't want to be doing it. We want to be in your will. That's the most important thing. And if you say, come, we want to go towards you. Keep us on track. Keep us on message. Keep us with great purpose in our hearts, Lord God. Father, we thank you so much for what you are doing right now. Minister to each and every person here. Maybe you are here. The sound of my voice this morning, whether it's here in the sanctuary or online. in the midst of those storms but you've never accepted Jesus as your Lord and Savior why not if doing the things that you're doing has not changed the course of your life why continue to do the same things over and over I guarantee you Jesus is telling you to come come to him it's the first place we step out on and I want to encourage you this morning, if you've never accepted Jesus as your, as your Lord and Savior, would you accept him now? He's crying out, come. Come to him, all those who are weary and burdened. Come to him this morning. He has never rejected anyone who earnestly comes to him. Not once. Not ever. And if you are here today and you're saying yes, I'm ready to go to Jesus. I'm ready to accept him. So I'm going to ask if you would, just pray this prayer with me. And I'm going to ask everyone to join with me out loud with this prayer. Nothing magic in these words or anything else. It just conveys a simple truth. Would you repeat after me, Heavenly Father, I believe that Jesus is the answer to all my needs. I believe that you raised Jesus from the dead. And that Jesus is Lord. And so I ask you, Jesus, to forgive my sins and to be my Savior. 
and I may follow you all the days of my life. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. Amen. If you prayed that prayer, would you let someone know? If you're here this morning and you prayed that prayer, I want to make sure you get a Bible. I want to make sure you get material to help you. I want to be able to talk with you, me and there's others as well. If you're online, would you fill out that Connect card? Let us know what you want to, that, that, that you, of your decision this morning. Let us know if you need a Bible. We'll make sure we get materials out to you. We'll send out a Bible this week. And for everyone who is here today, are you ready to get out of the boat? Are you ready to get out of your chair, out of the rows? Are you ready to seek Jesus for whatever it may be? And maybe you are walking on water right now. Then are you ready to pray for someone else? I'm just asking you right now, it's a good thing to change our positions. It's a walk of faith, it always is. And I'm gonna ask right now as our worship team leads us, would you come, regardless of what it is? It's easy to stay in the boat. It's easy to stay in our chairs, but sometimes we got to come out. Sometimes we got to take that step of faith and come forward and allow someone else to pray with us and for us. And so I'm going to ask right now to come. Join me at these altars, and let's seek God. Lunch can wait. I'm hungry too. Lunch can wait. But let's do business with God. Let's seek Him, church, and come. Let's